for the asset class, the dynamic asset class supply demand analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That note for the uh, financial uh, innovation uh, uh, development uh, lecture. How am I supposed to do that? I simulation. This is a lab. It's called active learning. Okay. I don't get up and lecture for three hours, you know, an hour and a half. Gold you guys are engaged in the process. You're basically traders. You're analysts. You're getting information that we need to be able to make investment decisions. <coughs> the markets change every second of the day due to news. Okay. Good news, bad news, wars, peace, trade wars, everything affects the markets. Where's oil for that? 
Yeah, so yeah. it's basically been in a trading range. Okay, it really hasn't done anything. When you think with inflation, inflation's running around 3%, wages are running around 3%, employment came out at 3.8. The job growth numbers for the last month are over 200,000. That's all inflationary. Oil's up. That's inflationary. Okay. It's inflationary, then probably bond yields are going up. If bond yields are going up, bond prices go down, you guys lost money in your portfolio. Where's the 10-year treasury yielding right now? Okay. You guys need to all be looking for this information. Uh, two two point nine what is it? 2.97. Is it up or down? Uh, up. Uh, up. up. Okay, so it's probably higher inflation expectations. We're going to Fisher curve, Fisher equation. Higher inflation expectations are going to push up the bond yields. Okay. So people are dumping bonds. Higher inflation expectation bond prices are up. Okay. But the stock market's up. So even though interest rates are up, obviously earnings expectations are growth rates are higher than the increase in the interest rates, which is compensating for the negative effect. Okay. So the stock prices are up. The things are booming. The best labor market and production markets, the best economy we've had, probably, probably since 1998, 99, 2000. 06, 07 was an okay uh, peak, you know, in the business cycle, but we're well beyond the 98, 99, 2000 period, which was the biggest bubble, you know, that we've ever seen. Okay, so we're back where we are today. All right, excellent. And where's the um, where's the dollar to the pound? I heard that. Uh, One point three. What is it? One point three. Yeah, is it up or down? I think, it's, I think it's actually been up, you know, over the last uh, 48 hours, which means that the uh, pound is appreciated and the dollar is appreciated because it now costs us more to buy a pound. Okay. So we need to be looking at those uh, those international factors. I already checked the uh, memo. One, anybody have any questions on the uh, statistical pretest? Okay. Um, and then uh, homework number one, you need to have a cover page the homework and you're going to need a cover page for the deliverable okay? because it's got a little too much. Okay? So you're going to give me the cover page right? and you're going to give me the college. That should be, you know, capitalization, 16 point, maybe 18 point, times Roman. Or give me your college. So there is college. Give me the uh, course. Section. Give you the term which we're in. Homework number one. Give me the title that needs to be bigger than the, that font size needs to be bigger than the other font size. And you're going to have two. It's going to be me, Rome, you. You're going to have the full dates for that. Do a good job on the homework cover page, and I'll check it. If you do a good uh, uh, job on that, then you can just swap this out and uh, put the little one in there and use that for the cover page for the okay. So once you get the cover page, and you're going to stick the homework uh, behind it, and you're going to staple it together. Okay, don't crimp it together, and don't hand me your homework loose. Okay, and don't have all the frilly stuff. On the side, okay. Uh, I've had people submit to me, you know, homeworks with tikka masala on it, and cat paws, and you know, cranked up, and just basically thrown. Uh, and I'm not going to come up with it. It's got to be professionally put together, all right. And that's going to be a piece of the deliverable package that will come together. And now I'm going to um, continue with the course review or the midterm, or the, sorry, quiz review. I've already handed out to you the notes that I took uh, for the dynamic asset class. Okay, next time I promise I'll staple them together. Please don't give me a bad review because I don't staple my stuff together. Uh, but I'll staple those together and provide those to you. Did anybody not get copies of this? Okay, they're right here if you need them. I also handed out the uh, financial product development and innovation lecture, which we went over just a little bit uh, last week. Uh, yeah, last week. I'm not going to have time to put it up on the board because it usually takes me about 30 minutes just to put it up on the board. So we're going to use just from here and you can take notes on it. Again, this, everything corresponds to the exam. So I'm giving you the exam, going over the exam, I'm giving you my notes to study from. And then on Sunday, and I'll even meet with you on Monday, on 
Sunday, uh, September 23rd, I already booked a room here in this uh, building in GB220. So I'm going to do a two hour review session for the exam. Okay. And then I'll be available from 8 to 9 and from 1 to 3 30 that Monday prior to the exam. You come in, you take the exam, you study, you take the exam, and then I basically take the exam back. You go study Tuesday night, all day Wednesday, Thursday morning, you come back, you, you resume taking the exam. Okay? And then you hand in the whole deliverable package to me that Thursday at the end. And I will have the deliverable graded and give it back to you by Tuesday. Okay? All right? Sorry, the date for this study session? It's going to be, it's on the notes that I gave. Oh, okay. So I did not, anybody not get the, uh, the notes? Okay, I don't have time to come in here and write it up on the board anymore because there's a class behind here, so I have to write up the notes that I otherwise would have on the board and make copies of them. Okay. So there should be some extra copies laying around. I don't have the rest of them. So anybody sitting on a stack of uh, class notes? Anybody sitting on a, a stack of class notes? I'll ask that again because I don't think you're When you get into class, you need to load up your computers and start um, giving me some of the data uh, the market updates. All right. No questions on the pretest I already asked. I already looked at the memos. Um, please get those memos to me as soon as possible. Please don't procrastinate. Um, usually at the end of the semester, I have three students per class that totally blew it off and they're in my office asking me to look at their memos and I'm like really frustrated because they had 15 weeks to basically work with me to get the memos perfect and they wait for the last minute to do it. It's just irresponsible, okay? So don't take these for, for granted. These are extremely important if you want to get a job, okay? Because they're going to ask for a writing sample. And this is the perfect writing sample. Because the reason why I brought this writing sample into the class is I kept getting told by multiple people in the industry that you guys can't write, you can't write a memo. So we are going to perfect that, okay? So we'll check that off. And then they, they say you can't do PowerPoint presentations that you can't present, check, did that one too. Um, they can't do the, the finance, they, even though we went over it, they still don't understand the finance, the economics, we'll go over that too, check. Okay, I'm just checking off the boxes, okay? So we already did the financial product process innovation, or no, we didn't, so let's go through that really quickly. Okay, so why don't you pull out the notes, and then we'll go through it really quickly. Okay. Everybody got their notes on the phone? Get your notes, there you go. Get your blue book, and get extra notes and stuff like that. Okay, so let's do it. So I introduced, I developed this model probably, I don't know, seven years ago. Uh, because I realized that uh, product innovation in the finance industry was exactly the same as the tech industry. So I went in and basically did the research and I found out uh, how these tech companies and how these finance companies basically product innovate. And they don't even, they don't just product innovate, they process innovate, they create technologies for internal processes to create productivity gains and cram down their expenses and create profit margin organically within the company. So they're creating basically revenue growth organically within the company by developing technologies and they're developing new products to sell into the marketplace to generate revenue on an ongoing basis forever. Wells Fargo, B of A, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, they've all been around over 100 years. 100, okay? So they know what they're doing, okay? Uh, so the first thing they do is they're constantly uh, scanning the marketplace, constantly scanning the market for change, either political change, regulatory change, demographic change, economic change. So they're constantly monitoring the market. If they see changes in the marketplace, they then have to respond to it. If they don't respond to it, they're going to become myopic. And their organizational structures are not going to match the environment. And they will probably go out of business, their stock price will fall, and they'll get taken out by a competitor that is more on top of what's going on in the marketplace. So the first is constant environmental scan on an ongoing basis and implementing change management due to regulatory changes or competitive 
at some point in time, there's a cognitive dissonance individually within the firm, particularly to the leaders, and in groups uh, because of the changes that are going on outside. It's an industrial psychology, it's individual psychology. But at some point, the cognitive dissonance in the organizational structure of the firm is so extreme, they have to change. They have to do something. And that's where they go through an organizational change and they restructure the firm. It's extremely costly to restructure your firm, but you got to do it. And if you look at the financial industry before uh, the uh, financial crisis in 2008, 9, and 10, and you look at the financial uh, environment, you look at the financial institutions and organizational structure today, it's very different. They've, they've significantly changed their org structure and restructure due to the financial crisis and due to regulatory changes and now demographic changes. Because now you are entering the workforce and changing the whole thing, okay, both politically and economically. Uh, you have to have cultural leadership. You have to have people inside the firm that are charismatic, that could be models for other people within the firm that they can emulate through the self-efficacy process to then uh, be able to create an environment of creativity. Uh, product innovation. So you need people within the firm that could be role models. There needs to be clear strategy, tactics, and operational planning. You can't just do it ad hoc. You've got to be very clear on your metrics from an operational standpoint. You've got to be realistic and achievable. And you have to lay out a five to seven year strategic plan and then tactical plans that are updated every year. Okay, so all of my strat strategic plans, my tactical plans, my operating plans are updated every year. Um, product and process innovation. To be able to process and product innovate, you will have had to have done it before. The question is, are you recording it? Okay. Are you recording the product and process innovation process? Do you have an enterprise resource planning system, the ERP in place? Do you have a knowledge base in place that basically is tracking all of the innovation that goes on? So that when the market changes or there's a need in the marketplace and you need to invent a product, you just go back to the knowledge base and you look up the product or the process that's very similar to the one that you've identified and you basically take that model and those people modify it and create the new product very quickly. And the speed in which you can bring those products to market is the number one goal. Can I develop, can I innovate, can I bring it to, to market, can I get into the early adoption, early majority phase of the adoption cycle very quickly? And can I do it over and over again um, at the end of the day? You got to be able to recognize the wants and the needs of your client. Okay? You got to solve the problem. And the product solves the problem. Financial products solve the problem. I'm going to run out of money. I need to retire. I need to create enough wealth for me and my family so that they can live at a certain standard of living forever and have them be able to do it when I'm gone. That's the number one problem. Is that a problem? Running out of money? Absolutely. Because either that or you're going to be homeless. And your kids aren't going to, you know, aren't going to college. That's the issue. Okay? So you've got to recognize the wants and the needs, and then you product develop. And you have an R&D staff, a research and development staff internally, that's constantly developing new products to solve new problems and bring those products to market. And they've got to be standardized and homogeneous to be able to manufacture it and get it into the market. The products have to be designed with the attributes that specifically solve the problem. Professor Souza, it's, 19, it's 2010. I just went through the financial crisis. I saw my portfolio drop 50 to 70 percent. I ain't retiring, and I'm concerned. Okay, I'm concerned. Do you guys have a guaranteed product, an investment product, that will basically immunize, immunize my portfolio from the next downturn? Because I know it's coming because it always comes. Yes, I can do that. Let me talk to the, some people. Within six months, the company uh, invented two guaranteed products that basically guaranteed the, uh, the investor that they would lose no money in the stock market. And if they gave us a million bucks, by the time they were 70 years old, we would guarantee to pay them $100,000 a year for the rest of their life. Or actually, if it was joint, we would give them, uh, we would give them what is 75,000 bucks a year for not only his life, but the wife's life. So 
So if he passed away, she would still be able to get 75 grand a year for the rest of her life. That solved a huge problem in the marketplace. In my company, New York Life invented it. Uh, product production in manufacturing and distribution. If you have the existing distribution channels to distribute your product, great. If you don't, you gotta buy it or you gotta build it, and that's expensive, okay? And that's why you see a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions, take takeovers of certain companies to basically expand uh, their distribution channels to different demographics and different economic segments of the marketplace, whoever you're selling into. You also have to have suppliers around you too as inputs into your production process. You gotta have supply chain management and you gotta optimize those uh, supply chain uh, supply chains. You gotta have at least some redundancy in the supply chain if one of your suppliers goes BK, you gotta have at least one or two to basically step in to provide the inputs. Uh, also on the distribution channels, um, you gotta have networks in place and you gotta come up with an optimal mix of how you distribute those products through the distribution network. So you're optimizing the distribution network, you're optimizing the supply and that's all optimization, and I think a lot of you have already gone through a lot of the stuff in your ops class. Um, then you business development. Then you do business development. You get out there. You gotta come up with clear and concise marketing and sales campaigns. You gotta come up with clear and concise marketing of the product so that it's easily understandable by the client. If the products are too complex, nobody's gonna buy it. Okay? So it's a fight between sophistication of the attributes of the, of the product and the clarity of the communication to get the uh, individual engaged. In financial services, there's two main uh, behavioral motivations for people to buy financial products. One is fear, and the other is greed, okay? Um, marketing, well, you're gonna have to conduct the uh, market research and figure out the market segments in which you're gonna target, and what products are gonna fit the market segments based on demographics, socioeconomics, uh, uh, psychographics and economics. Who are you targeting? What is your messaging? What is the product? What the attributes for the different market segments? And then you optimize it. I can't sell a small cap, high tech, exchange traded fund or mutual fund or a portfolio strategy to a 90 year old person, okay? I can't, it doesn't fit. I gotta sell them a fixed income portfolio or a fixed annuity. Okay? Um, so you gotta be able to optimize your marketing segments too. And then you gotta target your markets and figure out what markets are gonna basically uh, grow the fastest and create the most demand for your product to be able to generate the fees and the commissions and the assets under management that you need to be, be uh, profitable on an ongoing basis. Okay, on page two. So how do you segment the market? Well, if you're targeting businesses, it's gonna be by industry segments and it's gonna be by size. Are you looking for small firms, medium-sized firms, or large firms? I like to work with medium-sized firms. Okay. Big guys are already taking care of medium-sized firms. They grew into a medium-sized firm. They're still less sophisticated than they need my help. Okay. Small firms think they're smart as heck. They don't need my help, so they don't come to me until they're, they become a certain size and they realize that they have problems, okay? Uh, the advertising mix and advertising campaigns, how much of your advertising dollars, again, it's gonna be return on investment. How much of your advertising dollars are gonna be spent on radio, TV, social media, you know, billboards, you know, uh, mailers? I mean, how much are you gonna spend for each of those uh, campaigns? And they cost a lot of money, so you're gonna need a return on investment, and you're gonna need to break even on those things or else you're just wasting money, okay? So you gotta have very sophisticated advertising campaigns. And you really have to focus on the fee generation in financial services. Our, our goal is to get assets under management. I mean, BlackRock is what, like eight, five trillion, four trillion, JP Morgan's two trillion in assets. We're talking about huge companies. If you get like, you know, 50 basis points or 25 basis points or a quarter of a percent on all of that money, you're making billions and billions of dollars per quarter per year. Okay. So the economics are massive. And now with FinTech, financial technology, the ability to get into the marketplace and sell into the marketplace using social networks uh, through the adoption process has totally disrupted everything and made everything different. And the uh, larger firms are actually in the process of changing. So the key is assets under management. 
and commissions. Okay? I make money on commissions. I make money on assets under management. The more I sell, the more I have under management, the more money we all make. Okay? Uh, client prospecting. Once you get a client, it's not easy to get a client. You do a campaign. You do an outreach. You find some prospects call the prospects, get a hold of the prospects, get in front of the prospects, listen to the prospects, go back, write a strategy for them, go back in front of them, in front of the prospects, try to get them to buy, try to get them to close, try to get them engaged. It's really hard. But once you close on them, you've locked them in. Okay, just like Apple's locked you in on, their, um, on the iPhones, just like Microsoft has locked you in uh, on their um, OS operating system. Once you've got the client locked in, you've got recurring revenue. You can upsell them, cross-sell them, and you've got recurring revenue. That's the key at the end of the day. So the key at the end of the day is recurring cash flow and your conversion rate. Okay? I work with so many students <clears throat> on their resumes. They don't look at themselves as value-add people within their positions. They don't look at the conversion rates. Well, I reached out to 200 people last week. Great. How many people actually responded? 25. Okay, of the 25, how many did you close? 10. What was the average sale amount of those 10? Uh, 100 bucks. Uh, you can just start doing the mathematics on uh, it. So it's your conversion rate. Once you get the, the sales cycle down and you can start to accelerate it, then you start to scale. Okay? I sell a million dollars worth of life insurance, a million dollar life insurance policy. It's going to take me two weeks to two months to close that deal. It would take me the exact same amount of time to do a $10 million life insurance policy. So I go from selling $1 million policies to $10 million policies. Okay? So once you get the cycle down and the conversion rate optimized, boom, you scale it up and you start doing larger deals. That's called institutional okay? at that level. <clears throat> then at the end, of, and then at the end, you are constantly getting customer feedback. They're calling you, you're calling them, you're getting input, and you're feeding those inputs back through the cycle to be able to uh, develop new products and bring them to market based off of the concerns, wants, needs, problems that the customers are bringing to you. So you have the feedback loop. And you do all the prospecting and all the follow-up and all the feed feedback and all the scheduling, you're using the customer relationship management system or a CRI. Salesforce or Microsoft or Adobe or Oracle, it doesn't really matter. You're using the system basically to do the prospecting to accelerate the sales. And then we get through the uh, and reinvent through the product attributes. On page three of three, there's two models that we talk about when we're talking about industry structure and when we're talking about new product or process development. First is the S curves. Okay, you got IBM, you got Oracle, you got SAP, you got ITT, you got all of these companies that have been around 80 years. Okay. And what they've done is they, they constantly, over time, invented new technologies. Okay, new technologies. They can do it consistently and consecutively over time. That's also what the financial services firms do. So they're building technologies and products consistently over time. What that does is it creates this line right here, this upward line, this upward path. That basically is the revenue or the free cash flow growth rate expectations. If you can invent new technologies consistently over time to generate cash flow and revenue for the firm, the analysts and the investors will expect you to do it forever. And if you can maximize that growth rate and your free cash flow growth rates, you're going to maximize the value of the firm. Okay. So that's the first second test, and this is right up your, all of your alley, is the product adoption cycle, bringing new products to marketplace. When you bring a new product, the first people that are going to adopt it are the innovators. Okay, So you're, you're burning through cash, you're spending a lot of money, uh, and if you don't get out of the, uh, the innovator stage and you burn through all of your money as a fintech startup, you're done. Okay, You're dead. You're a zombie. You're done. You're toast. You're toast. But if you can get uh, now using social media and other uh, techniques getting into the early majority phase, which is the hockey stick phase, your production and your sales is growing at an exponential rate. It's all, it could go vertical. And that's the point in which a lot of these fintech firms and these startup companies go BK2 because the founders, were the engineers that basically invented the, the, the company and the product initially, 
but they don't know how to run a company that goes from a hundred, 10 million to 100 million to a billion in market cap you know, in two years. They don't know how to do it. We gotta be an expert in something. So they could die at the little majority phase too. And then you move into the uh, majority phase, which the majority of people have already adopted your product. Then you move into the late majority phase, and then you move into the laggards, which are the last people. So the key is to be able to invent new products and bring them to market consistently over time so that you're always maximizing the early majority adoption phases, which is bringing new products. You create that upward revenue growth path that maximizes the value of the firm. That's why these, uh, what are they called, unicorns, you know, market caps are in the billions of dollars and they have basically no earnings because they're still burning through cash and stuff and they're generating revenue. Um, but the market caps are really high. The values are really, really high during the billions because it doesn't cost a lot of money because it's mostly tech now. It doesn't cost, once you get through the initial phases, once you start running the operations, adding space and processing and programmers is not very expensive and you're working on an agile and virtual type of culture, that kind of company is very flat. So the overhead is really low, so your profit margins are really high. Okay. And that's basically the modern period. When you, in, when you start new products, it's gonna cost you money. Okay, so there's gonna be uh, some costs involved with the, uh, uh, with the money that you're gonna invest in these new products. You're gonna have burn rates, so there's some costs. And then you're gonna have to do the capital budgeting, which is what you're gonna be learning in this class. You've already started in the discounted cash flows, and we're going to go over some valuation techniques on Thursday. Um, start doing more discounted cash flows. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to project out the cash flows for the company, okay, or this, for this product, project out the cash flows and the terminal value, and I'm going to discount that back to the present to get the present value. Once I get the present value, I'm going to subtract all, out all the costs that I did to, to launch this thing. If my net present value is positive, present value minus the cost, my net present value is positive, I am going to accept the development and, and the uh, de uh, development of this product. I'm going to accept it. Okay. So NPV. If my rate of return on the product, the rate of return over time is higher than my cost of capital, I'm going to accept it. Uh, and if I can break even, if I can break even, it costs me 100 million to invent this thing, but I can get a 100 million in a year back, so my break even is one year or less, I'm really happy. And in the tech industry, the break even is less than one year. In the financial services industry, depending on what the product is, um, it could be up to three years, but no more. If it's not adopted after three years, they're going to cut it or sell it or abandon it or discontinue it, okay, because it just never never took off. And then the last thing is you have to have really smart people uh, working with you at senior level executive levels that basically can make the decision to enter the marketplace and build the product. Once they build the product, they also have to be really smart and have rules in place to be able to exit the market. Do we keep the product line internally as internal cash flow to pay out to, as dividends to our shareholders? Or do we spin it out as an initial public offering or an IPO as a separate entity and, and do a capital event through an exit strategy and basically monetize our efforts through an exit strategy into the public markets? Okay. And if you can do that over and over and over again, you'll be extremely successful. This is not just applied to financial services, it's applied to every type of company. Okay. So this, that lecture was basically a mini capstone you're going to get in the last semester of your graduate year. Okay, that's what that lecture is. Okay. So now that you understand it, I think you'll be in a, in a better position. How much time do I have? An hour. Perfect. Um, let's go over here and let's do the modern and postmodern portfolio theory. If you're a company, if you're a company, are you going to have multiple uh, product lines? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, do you want all of your product lines, cash flows, and returns on, on those product lines? Do you want them all to be perfectly positive and correlated with each other within your firm? 
No. No. Because if the market goes down or the economy goes into a recession, and you don't have a counteracting division aligned to offset the losses in the cash flows, in one division you're going to make. Okay. So you have to have divisional lines where the correlations in the cash flows have, are low, no, or negative with each other. And you're going to have to optimize them. You're going to take over from it. Yeah, you might want to just pick it up and move it up. So when you're building a portfolio, you need to build a portfolio and add assets to the portfolio whose returns have low, no, or negative correlation with each other. Low, no, or negative correlation. And we went over that at the last time. We build the correlations. Correlations. Low covariance. Wasn't that on the pretest? Yeah. To lower the portfolio standard deviation. I would add assets to the portfolio whose returns have low covariance with each other and low correlation with each other. And that will take down the portfolio standard deviation. So Harry Markowitz in 1957 invented modern portfolio theory. Okay? And then derivatives were invented after that, uh, which created postmodern portfolio theory. This is the basic structure of the modern portfolio theory itself. All the capital allocation lines. This is how I would draw this exactly like this on the exam. When you come into the exam, this is the strategy that you should take. Okay? If you don't do it this way, you're going to mess up. Okay? So first, you're going to start off with the capital allocation line, and this is going to be the risk-free range. Now here, this is the expected return on the portfolio. Expected return on the portfolio. So your y-axis is the expected return on the portfolio. And your x-axis is the standard deviation of the portfolio. We all know what the standard deviation equation is, right? Right? It was on the pretest, and it's in the book. Okay? And then right here, dot, and then what I do is I go like that. Then what you're going to do is go like this. Boom. Okay. This is called the efficient frontier. Okay. This is the efficient frontier. At any point along the on the efficient frontier, any point on the efficient frontier. Point inside the efficient frontier are actually portfolios that I can construct and sell to my clients. Okay? Those are portfolios. This right here, when the capital allocation line is tangent to the efficient frontier, and where the investor utility curve tangent. How I do it. It took me years to be able to do this. When the investor utility curve, curve and the capital allocation line and the efficient frontier are tangent to each other, that is the market basket. That is the market basket. Okay. This is the point. This is the point highest expected return at the given level of risk. This point also, you've seen the equation on the pretest, expected return of the portfolio divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio. And what's this called? risk is just a greater return. So it's the point in which I'm maximizing 
the return at the given level of risk. So it's the unit of return per unit of risk. So maximizing. Okay. And let me go back to these utility curves. One, two, and three. If I was an investor, would I want to be up here? No. Why not? High return, low risk. I want to be up there. High return, low risk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the problem is, is there's nothing out there. There's nothing out there in the marketplace right now that gives you high return and low risk. It's not the way fi the law of finance works. Okay, financial economics. So investors have to lower their utility, and they lower their utility to the point where the utility curve is tangent to the capital allocation line and the efficient frontier. That's called the market basket. And I'll talk about the market basket. Okay. This point right here, right here, this is 100% stocks. So I have a portfolio where all of my money is invested in stocks. High return, high risk. That makes sense. Right? Because stocks are extremely volatile. This point down here, the bonds, 100% portfolio of bonds. Low return, low risk. Basically, this is the this is the basic model, okay? the modern portfolio theory. So, if I'm willing, as an investor, to take on more risk, this is just a two asset class portfolio. This is not a multi asset class portfolio. This is just two asset classes. This is stocks and bonds. Okay? <clears throat> and if I'm willing to take on more risk to get a higher rate of return, because I want a higher rate of return, I'm willing to take more risk, I can just increase my allocation to stocks. And I can move out to the efficient frontier. If I uh, if I'm willing to take lower return to get low risk because I'm really risk averse, I'm willing to take lower return for low risk, then I can basically sell off my stocks and start buying more bonds. So basically depending on who you are as the investor, you can basically design the portfolio to meet your, meet your criteria, meet your needs. Also, what we can do is through the process of leverage, okay, leverage, margin accounts. I can open up a stock brokerage margin account. I put money in. I can uh, apply to the broker-dealer uh, to get credit, to borrow from the broker-dealer at 8 9%. And I can take that borrowed money and I can double down on the state. <clears throat> so I'm using leverage. And when I use margin, when I use leverage, I can actually jump off the efficient frontier. I can jump off the efficient frontier and move up the capital allocation line. And I'm going to get even more, take on even more risk at an even higher also move up the capital allocation line if I'm investing in real estate because I'm going to take on a mortgage. So I'm leveraging that. Okay. I can also jump off the efficient frontier through the process of lending. Frontier, and I can move down the cal capital allocation line through the process of lending. That's what banks do. They basically lend on businesses, but the business is collateral. They lend on real estate, where the real estate is collateral for the loan. They basically uh, lend, you margin, but 
from your stock portfolio. Um, with the stock as the collateral. If you default on any of those loans, they will uh, go after your business, they will go after your real estate, and they will liquidate your stock portfolio. Okay, so that's the two stock portfolio. Now, over the last 20 years, there's been an introduction of new asset classes okay, to the capital markets called alternative assets. Alternative assets such as real estate, such as uh, private equity, private equity firms, private placements, those types of products are not publicly traded. Those are private market alternative assets. Alternative assets, since they do not trade in the marketplace, have low, no, or negative correlation with stocks and bonds. Okay. And actually, some of the asset classes, like real estate, actually are positively correlated with inflation, where stocks and bonds are negatively correlated with inflation. So I can diversify the pro my portfolio, my stock bond portfolio, by investing in al alternative assets. Okay. And over the years, I would say in the, uh, I would say 19, through to, let's say, 1970. The allocation in the marketplace, the market basket, and we were designing, you know, I look a lot younger than I am, but in the 1920s through the 1970s, when we were designing portfolios for pension funds and individuals, the allocation was 70% bonds. And then in the 1980s, 1980 to 1990, uh, Ibbotson and Associates uh, did some research for Congress. And basically, Congress uh, passed legislation called ERISA. And ERISA basically stated that all pension funds should have a real estate allocation in it. And Ibbotson's research basically came up with an allocation of 10%. Okay, so based on the research, we took from the bond portfolio because real estate acts like a bond but it's an, it's an inflation hedge. And we kept the allocation of stocks and we gave 10% of the bond allocation participation, direct ownership of real estate or ownership of real estate within a fund okay, by these uh, high net worth individuals or pension, but really pension funds. And then in the 1990s to 2000, 1990 to 2010, the market basket shifted again. We took 10% uh, from bonds kept the allocation to stocks, we still had an allocation to real estate, and the next asset class that was introduced based on additional research from Ibbotson was a 10% allocation to cash value, life insurance. Cash value, life insurance. You're paying the premiums, value in it. These are permanent policies that are guaranteed to pay off. And actually, the banks went into this and started putting permanent whole life insurance on all of their senior executives. And then using the cash value in those policies as tier one liquid capital for the financial institution. So institutionalized uh, insurance. Okay. And made it part of the portfolio. And then in 2000, through where are we now? 2018. 
new asset class was introduced into the uh, market basket. So we took again in the bonds, 30% bonds, we kept the allocation to stocks, we still had an allocation 10% to real estate, we still had an allocation of 10% insurance, and Ibbotson did the research again, along with uh, Deutsche Bank, Reef. Research with Ibbotson and basically said we also need an allocation, an alternative renewable energy. Governor Brown just made a mandate for 2045 that we'll have 100 percent of our energy source from alternative renewable energies. So this is basically the new for you. This is your target. For your target portfolio allocation for the next 40 years. Okay. We're putting institutional investors into this allocation. Okay. So why would we include these alternative asset classes into the stock bond portfolio? Okay. There's two reasons. Okay. Because when you add an asset, asset classes, into your stock bond portfolio, whose returns have low, no, and negative correlation with the stock bond portfolio, this is what happens. And you need to, you need to get this on your exam. You need to get this on your exam. This is the most important thing. What it does is it bows out. The efficient frontier. It bows out the efficient frontier. You need to write that down. Because that's the first thing I look at when I'm grading the exam. Now what happens is, is when you add these alternative assets to your stock bond portfolio, yep, your expected return on the portfolio is going to go down. Okay. But your portfolio standard deviation of the risk of the portfolio goes down even more. So yes, when I Add these alternatives to my portfolio, it throws out the efficient frontier, my expected return is reduced, but my risk is reduced even more. So my expected return goes down. Okay, you guys need to watch this in the back there. You need to watch this in the back. Okay, you need to watch this in the back. You gotta, you gotta watch this, okay. Um, the portfolio standard deviation goes down even so what happens to the risk-adjusted rate of return? So by adding the alternative assets to my stock bond portfolio, my clients are better. Now here's the goal. If I can get my investors 8 to 10% rate of return as an expected return, if I can manage the portfolio and get my investors an 8 to 10% rate of return, expected return, what happens to the size of the portfolio in less than 10 years? What happens to my portfolio value? If I can get the rule of 70-10. It'll double. It'll double. Right. So I can double, if I can lock in and get an expected return, an 8 to 10% rate of return for my clients, their portfolio is going to double in less than 10 years. So if I can add in these alternative assets, in a diversified multi-asset portfolio, I can bow out the efficient frontier, I'll lower the return, but the risk is reduced even more, I can increase the risk-adjusted rate of return on the portfolio, and if I can get 8 to 10% rate of return, I can double their money in less than 10 years. That's it. That's what we're looking for. CalPERS, CalSTRS, Ohio Stirs, City and County of San Francisco, Michigan, Pension Fund of Michigan, that's what we're all looking for. And if we can do this for our clients, we're going to get assets under management. We'll have billions under management. And we'll charge for this. Okay. That's the goal. All right. All right. So, oh, oh, and the last piece. Oh, I totally forgot. This is the kicker. This is the kicker right here. So I can design this not only for pension funds, but I can design these portfolio strategies for high net worth individuals. 
I got a client, he's probably worth 25 million bucks, okay? Uh, I put a $5 million life insurance policy on him. Because if he goes BK, something happens to him, he's a senior level executive within a firm. It's gonna destroy value within the company. And he also sits on multiple boards. So the boards are gonna be disrupted too, okay? And he's got kids, and he's got a wife, okay? And this could be a, uh, this could be you, this could be a woman scenario too. You, your, your human capital value is so high that if something happens to you, it will disrupt everything within your life, okay? And everything that you build. So you need the life insurance. So what happens is you get the life insurance on the principal, and if the principal passes away, the death benefit is in, injected into the portfolio, and the heirs end up on a higher utility curve. And that's where they wanted to be originally. So the invention of an application of life insurance could, if the principal passes away, the death benefit is injected into the portfolio, which jacks the expected return, and actually puts the heirs and puts the recipients, puts the beneficiaries on a higher utility curve through the use of insurance. That's amazing. That's huge. When you go to work, when you go to work, they may ask you, they will probably slap disability insurance on you and life insurance on you too. But if you have a startup company and you want to borrow 25 million bucks, uh, I hope to God that you're healthy enough to get the life insurance because they may require it to pay them back if something happens to you. Okay? It's a way of hedging off human uh, capital. <laughs> So on the exam, we're going to do the derivative trades next. If I think the value of my portfolio is going to go down, I can write forwards, I can write futures, I can write puts on the futures, I can write calls, I can buy puts, I can write calls, I can go short. All of the down scenarios um, is a portfolio insurance. So through the application, so through the application, The application of the derivatives creates portfolio insurance. So if I think that the price or the returns on my portfolio are going to go down, I apply the portfolio insurance to close out the efficient frontier. So when I add these assets, to my portfolio, that's modern portfolio theory. I'm getting diversification by adding alternative assets to my stock bond portfolio. That's modern portfolio theory. But when I apply derivative contracts as tools to apply portfolio insurance to my portfolio, that's financial engineering. That's postmodern. That's postmodern. Financial engineering is just like mechanical, electrical, computer science. It's just like engineering, you're basically doing the exact same applications of the calculus and the integrals and the physics and the chemistry you're using. All those models are all used in designing derivative contracts. So this is the financial engineered solution to bow out the efficient frontier. This is the diversification application, traditional modern portfolio theory to bow out the efficient frontier. So if we're heading into a recession, which at some point the, the market is going to, would you say start to move your money out of stocks more into the real estate and insurance and renewable yeah. energy? Yeah. So it, the the breakdown would look different. It would be uh, the it would probably just start reallocating. Okay. okay. Into these, these provide a higher uh, return because they don't trade in the marketplace. So there's not as much systematic risk to these, but they're illiquid. Is the problem? So you're giving up. Liquidity for safety, okay? But again, you gotta underwrite your real estate, you gotta underwrite your insurance company, buy the right products, and you gotta invest in the right alternative renewable energy funds. And these things aren't even, there, there are no real 
alternative renewable energy companies traded on in the public markets. There's a lot of closed end funds and infrastructure projects, money going in here, but they're not widely available to people like us. And I was hoping there would be, when I started working in this space in 2009, almost 10 years ago, I thought it would be more prevalent by now. How much time do we have? Okay, perfect. I can do the, can move the, uh, the camera over. Does anybody have any questions about this? This is the kind of the logic I'm looking for in the exam, as much detail as possible. You can, the more precise drawing that you can put in there, the best. Because you may actually be, you may want to be, become a professor, you may want to be a teacher, you might have to get up to the board someday and start diagramming stuff in front of the board or senior level managers, and you got to start getting comfortable jumping up there and start diagramming. I know I don't have the, the best uh, handwriting and stuff, but it's the best I can do to try to convey the knowledge through a more inter interactive artistic approach, as opposed to, I could have done this in PowerPoint if I wanted to. Go ahead. Yeah, I do have a quick question. I think I missed it. On the Efficient Frontier, it has like the little um, curves on the bottom of it, and I was wondering why it's like that. Yeah, that's the um, Efficient Frontier umbrella, and you know, I can't really, I don't remember exactly why it is like that? Um, maybe, maybe you guys can find out for me. I just don't remember why it's called the efficient frontier umbrella, you know, and why it goes like that. Okay. Uh, maybe you can work with me and help me figure that out. I just haven't. I just don't remember. To be honest. Um, so let's do. Any other questions? Because when you take my investments class, if you're a finance major, we would actually run the uh, the optimization program in Excel, or you can do it in R too. That would actually run this thing and kick out uh, kick out these weights. And we also run through the optimization, and we trace out uh, the efficient frontier, and we also trace out the capital allocation. And we could do the utility curves too. I just haven't programmed it yet uh, in the software. Any questions? All right, let's do the derivative trades. So there's only two sets of trades. Maybe you guys can look it up. You, you've already made an attempt at the memo. So you know there's basically two sets of trades. The prices go up and the prices go down. There's only two. Only two sets of trades. You don't have to memorize a, a matrix. There's, you got to memorize the two sets. We're going to trade derivatives off indices, stock indices, bond indices, alternative indices could be anything. Uh, we're going to trade uh, some on the exchange traded funds. Is everybody clear what an exchange traded fund or an ETF is? Do you know what an ETF is, yes or no? No. No? Okay. Um, I, have a, I have the S&P 500, okay, for example. At the S&P 500, that's made up of 500 stocks. Okay. It's an index. So the stock price multiplied by the shares outstanding is going to give me the total market cap, the value of the market for that for that stock currently in the marketplace. Do that for all 500. Add it up, divide it back. I'm going to get the weights. So basically, the S&P 500 index is replicated as a stock portfolio. The stock portfolio is the ETF. And the ETF is publicly traded. It's a share that's publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So basically, what you're buying and selling and trading is a portfolio of stocks, one share in a portfolio of stocks, replicated after the S&P 500 index. So this was invented by BlackRock in San Francisco, Barclays. Uh, Barclays was the predecessor to the exchange traded fund because the mutual funds, mutual funds, mutual funds, uh, are only priced at the end of every day, are highly liquid and have high fees. People said, well, I want to trade these mutual fund type, type portfolios. Um, 
So BlackRock invented the exchange traded fund and said, okay, you can still trade these portfolio strategies of your mutual funds, but now instead of trading them at the end of every day, you can trade them every second of the day. And you can trade uh, futures, uh, you can trade uh, uh, puts and calls on them too, and you can go short and you can buy on margin. So it basically liquefied um, these portfolios and allowed for, the, for you to be able to trade and buy these exchange traded funds at very low fees. Okay, yes, go ahead. Um, is it always based on the S&P 500? No, it could be the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It could be the NASDAQ. Uh, it could be just tech. So somebody could create an exchange traded fund that just has the top 500 tech firms. Okay. Or defense, or medical, or consumer products, or some other type of permeate Permeation. Okay, yeah, because when I was doing the memo, I, I noticed there are a lot of different ones. Like yeah, there's a lot of different ones. D O B B Y P or something like yeah, that. Yeah, for the uh, for the memo, what I said was just you know track the three major stock indexes for the first memo, pick the top, go find three exchange traded funds based off of the indexes, and then pick one index and pick the top five companies and put them as the stocks that you're, you're trading, just to make it simple. But you can put any ETF in there if you want to. It's got to be a stock ETF for the first memo, and then it's got to be five stocks. When you do oil, you're going to be doing oil indexes, either stock indexes or the spot market, where oil is trading in the spot market. There's indexes for that, either Brent crude or West Texas Intermediary. You can find indexes on that. You can go find futures uh, indexes futures price indexes. Um, again, you can put those in there too, you can trade those. And then you're gonna find oil company uh, exchange traded funds with just oil companies in them. And then you're gonna find five oil companies. And you're gonna do the same thing for gold. Okay. And then you're gonna find international when you do uh, the dollar memo. And then when you do bonds, you're gonna be uh, doing bond indexes, bond ETFs, and just leave when you do the bond memo, just leave the same five company tickers in there because most of those big companies also have bonds that you could be trading if you want to. Okay. All right. So let's do the trades. Maybe you guys can look at your memos and start yelling out the trades for me. So if I think that the value of the index is going to go up, what would be my trades? You need to pull out your memos. That's why I gave you those things. I spent a lot of money copying these things for you, right. handing them out to you. These are all your resource materials. Okay? I don't know if it was on in your other classes, okay? You guys just hang out and sit back and just let the professor talk. This needs to be engaging. Okay? You You're going to buy forwards. Huh? You're going to buy forwards. Excellent. And then what else? That's, it should be all of your, because I read about you know, 500 memos a semester, and you want to put it in this order, okay? and use exactly the same terminology, because okay? it allows me to be able to scan this stuff pretty quickly. All right, and what about the exchange traded funds? Do you think that the price of exchange traded funds are going up? How would we trade that? Buy on margin. Got it. That's how, that's how we're going to make money. Okay. And by implementing these, uh, these trades here, I got 10 million bucks. I got $10 million to invest. I could invest in these uh, securities outright, or I could use these derivative contracts and take my $10 million 
and create $100 million of buying power through the process of leverage. So what would I rather do if I know I'm right? Would I rather invest $10 million or $100 million and be right? This is what the hedge funds do, the private equity firms do. That's why they hire these plot people with data analytics and engineering backgrounds because they build all these models to basically trade this stuff and make billions of dollars. Yes. Can you explain what this is? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in a second. I'm just going through the logic. Okay. Um, and then how are we going to trade the, the stocks? Buy on margin. Got it. In the memo, what did we have? We were tracking and trading three indexes, we were tracking and trading three ETFs, and we were tracking and trading five stocks. So how many total trades do we have? How many trades do we have here? No, we don't have total. Yep. Oh, yeah, we do. That's right. So what do we have, 12 here? And nine, nine, and 36. So I got 36 opportunities to So let's do, if we, for forecasting the prices to go down, or the value of the currencies to go down, what would be our trades? And the same trades would be the same trades that we apply as portfolio insurance to the portfolio to hedge off the market risks, the downside risks. So what would be the, what would be my trades? If I think the indices are gonna uh, ride forwards. Right forwards. You want to put a note that when you write anything, you're putting money in the pocket. You're writing the contract. The, the other guy on the other side is giving you the money and you're stuffing the money in your pocket. Okay? And if you're right, you get to keep the money. Okay? What else? You write futures. Futures. What else? Write calls on futures. Calls, futures, and what else? Buy puts. How many do it on time? 20. Perfect, okay. And then the exchange traded funds. I think the prices of my exchange traded funds in my portfolio are gonna go down. How would I hedge off the market risk and apply the portfolio insurance? Am I going to be investing in stocks? Am I going to have stocks in my portfolio? Yeah. Am I going to have stocks in my 401k, my IRA? I'm going to be investing in my company stocks. Am I going to have stocks in my portfolio? Yeah, and if I think that the value or the price of my stocks are going to go down, what, what, what uh, tools, what derivative trades would I implement to be able to hedge off that downside risk and apply the portfolio insurance to my stock portfolio? I did. Sell short. Sell short. Okay. Break calls. Break calls. Break calls. Break calls. And if I'm trading three indices, I get four trades. How many trades do I have? Twelve. And how many do I have for the uh, ETFs? How many do I have for the stocks? 15. And how many total trades? 36. So, how much time do I have? 19 minutes. Let's get back to your question. What are these things? So you can always go to chapter 20 or 22 or Google or uh, go online to the. Uh, can you turn the camera over here? online research and I'll do a quick quick little uh, what are these things? Breaking 
we'll go into the options uh, chapter of the uh, which I highly, highly recommend doing some additional things. The reason why I'm going through this right now is because we went through it at the end of the semester and you guys are so focused on getting out of here that you'll re never remember anything when it comes to the And they're complex enough as it is, so you gotta bring it up front into the class. You know, it's painful, but just, you know, stick with it. Because by the end of the semester, you'll totally get all this stuff. And uh, the course won't be this intense uh, by the end of the class. Okay. So I'm front loading the class. So this class is really hard right up front, in the first third, and then it takes it off. And, we, and then we start building on our knowledge. Okay. So the worst part, you know, is all this over. All right. Um, so let's talk about these things. Let's talk about uh, forward contracts. Now, forward contracts. Forward contracts, forward contracts, trade in the over-the-counter market. We trade in the over-the-counter market. Which is called the OTC. And the only people who can trade these forward contracts are large financial institutions and multinational corporations. We can't trade in the following market. We can't participate, unless I'm a trader. And I work with Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. These are custom con contracts that are basically written up between the two counterparties by a securities attorney, which I highly recommend that some of you or all of you go on to become a securities attorney you'll be extremely successful, it's really hard to get. <clears throat> and the, uh, also you're working with investment banks. Okay, so you get the Goldman Sachs, you get the securities attorney, you get two counterparties, one person wants to hedge off the risk in, in their portfolio, the other person doesn't think the market's gonna go down, they think it's gonna go up, they basically write a contract between the two counterparties. And if the market actually goes down, the person who wrote the contract pockets the money, the person who who thinks the market's going to go up has to pay the counterparty. And these uh, forward contracts are long-term contracts. They get to go from two to four years in some cases. And these are long-dated custom contracts traded in the over-the-counter market between two counterparties negotiated by the investment bank and written up by the securities attorney. Okay. So two years. You enter into the contract. What do you want to? Um, what do you want to? What market do you want to do? Oil, gold, stocks, bonds. It doesn't matter. Gold. Gold. So this is going to be a gold index. And most of these indexes are produced and published by Standard and Poor's, S and P. That's what they're known. For. Okay. And I've done a lot of index construction in my career too. Okay. I've built a lot of these. Things. <clears throat> okay, so you have gold. And the gold index is tied to the gold spot price. What was gold trading at today? How much? What was gold trading at ounce? You need to know this stuff. It's also on the exam. 1200. Like 12, 1200 bucks. Okay. So let's start out at 1200 bucks okay, per ounce. Right. So that's going to be the reference rate okay, within the contract. And then, obviously, gold. Up, down, over time, like this, and boom, at the end of the two year period, it's up there. So you're going to buy a full one. You're going to buy a full contract. Now, the person who wrote the contract, the person who wrote the contract, the writer, short four things that the prices are going to go down and the buyer is going long and they think the price is going to go up so let's say it goes to I don't know let's say uh, 2200 something about a thousand dollars over 
So the contract settles at the end of the two year period. And that's when the money exchanges. So the person who wrote the contract, are they receiving the money or are they paying the money? If the person who the person who wrote the contract thinks the price is going to go down, but the price actually went up. So at the end of the contract period, did the writer like uh, receive money or pay out money? Yeah. Yeah. Pay the money. Okay. Yeah, pay the money. Pay the money. And the person who bought the contract gets the gets the thousand dollars times the you know times the notional value of it. So they're going to make whatever you know, the amount. Twenty-two hundred times some some number is going to give them whatever it is that, that they pay. Okay. The other is the opposite side of the uh, of it is I think the prices are going to go up, but somebody else thinks that the price is going to go down. So over time, then prices start to move, and then all of a sudden. Drops to 800, 800 plus thousand. Okay. So at the end of the two-year period, who's going to pay pay the amount? Who gets the money? Who pays the amount? What happens to the writer? Who's going to receive the money? What about the buyer? So if I'm a gold company that produces gold, and I think prices are going to go down. Am I going to be writing or buying a forward contract? Buying. Writing or buying. I think prices of gold are going to go down. I produce oil. My revenues are going to go down. Am I going to buy or write the contract? Buy, yeah. Am I going to buy or write it? Yeah. If I think prices are going to go down and my revenues are going to go down because the price of gold is going down, am I going to buy or write a contract? Right. I'm going to write a contract. Right. And if I think that prices of gold are going to go up, and I actually use gold as an input into my production process, so my costs are going to go up, my profits are going to shrink, to hedge off rising gold prices, am I going to buy a right of forward contract? If I'm going to hedge off, that's it, you're going to buy it. So if I'm going to be detrimentally affected uh, by rising gold prices, I'm going to buy a forward contract. If I'm going to be detrimentally impacted by falling prices, I'm going to write a contract. So I can use these forward contracts to hedge off the market risk, uh, specifically affecting me as an operator in the marketplace. Derivative contracts are used by all corporations of a certain size as prudent financial planning and treasury operations, treasury functions within the company. And the portfolio managers use these derivative contracts to be able to hedge off market risk and lock in the expected return and lower the, the standard deviation of the and increase the risk adjusted rates of return. So these uh, you know, derivative conversations and derivative exposures to you is, uh, and through the educational process should not be done at the end of the, end of the semester or even skipped over totally, but need to be discussed right up front so that you totally understand it because it's standard. It's standard operating procedure within all major corporations. Okay. How much time do I have? Eight minutes, okay. So futures contracts are basically the same, okay, as forward contracts. Except we're not looking at two years, we're looking at two months. We're looking at two months. And the futures contracts are not over the counter, over the counter these contracts are on the exchange. Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So they're standardized contracts. They're standardized contracts traded on an exchange. And the counterparties are not in the forward contracts. It's basically a counterparty. But in the futures, you have the exchange. Writer, buyer, you can go through an exchange. And the exchange makes you put up 
uh, margin to trade in these things to avoid, and they exchange acts as an intermediary to mitigate any counterparty risk. And they're highly liquid. They're highly illiquid. So let's say that this is, I'm buying a forward con a futures contract, I'm buying a futures contract. It trades every single day, okay? It trades every single day. So here's my strike price during the day. Price goes up. I bought it. Here's the money. Actually, the prices go against me during the day. <coughs> I lose money. At the end of the day, these contracts settle. I lose the money. Money goes into my account. I'm out of the money. Money gets taken out of my account. There's not enough money in the account. I got to put up margin. I got to put up some money. So the futures contracts are constantly you're buying a long dated contract that you're settling every single. He's going in and out of these contracts every single day. And if you wrote the contract, if you wrote the contract, and prices go down, you're getting you win. If you bought the contract and prices go up. All of a sudden, prices start going. In. You bought the contract. And prices start to go down, and you start losing money. What you would do is you would offset the trade and write a contract and close it out. So the trade's going against you. I bought the futures contract. Prices are going down. I'm losing money. I write a, a futures contract. And close it out. Okay. Boom. Done. The deal. Same thing. Prices are going up. I wrote the contract. I'm shoving the money out because I'm losing. So I thought it was going to go down. It's actually going up. I'm going to, because I wrote the contract, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy a futures contract. You can close out the position. So I'm done. Cut my losses. Okay. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Uh, why, don't I do, uh, why don't I do the auction contract? Thursday. I'll spend like 10 minutes on the auction. I think you want to spend a little bit more time on these derivatives if you know, look at the chapter, look at the list, and have an idea. Yeah. But I don't want to get too far into it because I don't want to get too technical. I just want you to learn the trades and learn some of the fundamentals around these things.